Um, hi, I'm just welcoming you all today um, just to our second episode of Time to Chat. And um, I'm really, really honoured to interview Barbara Arrowsmith Young. Um, I think, Barbara, every time I've had the privilege of um, introducing you, I cry. So I'll try not to cry today. Um, so I just wanted to share, it was nearly three years ago, um, five years ago, sorry, in 2015. Um, when I actually dropped my daughter off at school and she hadn't slept and she didn't want to go to school and I came home and I just really um, didn't know what to do with her. I felt like I needed to homeschool her um, and I went off to a, uh, you know, I didn't have time to feel sorry for myself and went off to an art class and I was telling her art teacher and um, she told me about the Aerosmith program. I came home, looked it up watched 60 minute video and it was literally about three weeks later, we were on our way to, I think your first summer school that you were holding in 2015. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I was in awe of meeting you because I had, I hadn't read your book, but I had read a lot online before we came. And um, I felt like this was our hope. Something mm -hmm. we had tried everything else. We tried tutoring. We tried all different therapies, and and it just like it things weren't connecting. And I guess um, you know th there's a there's a proverb that uh, that says that hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream mm -hmm. fulfilled is a tree of life. And mm -hmm. um, I, I I felt like you know when we had been given no hope right through in many different um, times we had been given on a good diagnosis um that when i heard about the arrowsmith program and it made sense to me um that this was hope gave us hope again and so i just wanted you to share um today, just your journey as a child and how you've gone through university and what your parents did to help you to get um where you are today and how you designed the arrowsmith program i was reading something that um sort of ties in with this and, and you, you, um, you always said that you want people to dare to dream and mm -hmm. that's through cognitive transformation that we help unlock each individual gifts, allowing them to dare to dream. And it was that, that once we had been at the summer school, and I think there was about 24 kids at the first summer school, 12 of us were from Australia. And um, I remember all of us, we could have had an Aussie barbecue, you know, I, I remember all of us saying we had nothing to lose. Nothing back home was working and we all came searching for that hope to help our children and that, you know, your dare to dream. Now, the transformation in, in our whole family's life, not just my daughter's, but our whole family life has been, like, I can't, like, ever... It, thank you enough um, mm. in, in what you've walked through, the hard journey you've walked through to bring this life-changing program to many people around the world, which is now we're all online, has gone you know, globally. Um, so I just wanted you to share with us just your journey and how you have, um, w where you are now. Mm. Well, thank you. And also, before I start and share my journey, I want to just say, Thank you to you, Kylie, for bringing the work back to Australia, because that's part of my dream is to make this work accessible to individuals around the world that struggle with um, different learning challenges. And it was, you know, your going back home and bringing this to uh, Brisbane, right, and um, empowering lives. So thank you, because you are part of my dare to dream and bringing that dream to reality. So I'm, I'm, I'm deeply grateful and um, humbled by, you know, your passion and commitment to making a difference in the lives of, of uh, students that struggle with learning. So thank you. Thank so you. I, will, I will start there. And uh, in terms of, you know, my journey, it started a lot of years ago. Um, so when I started schooling, it was sort of towards the end of the 1950s. And at that time, there wasn't even a concept of having a learning difficulty that the terminology didn't exist. So I, it was clear in grade one that I was struggling. Um, 
and my teacher identified me as having a mental block because that was the terminology that was was used and part of my difficulty was comprehension and i was quite concrete i took things literally so i actually imagined that i had a wooden cube like you know a children's block in my head that made learning difficult well i didn't have a block um, or a piece of wood, but later I learned I had blockages in part of my brain that made certain aspects of learning very difficult. And I really feel that in grade one, I was given a life sentence. Um, I overheard my teacher tell my mother, I don't have high expectations for your daughter. She is not going to amount to much. All of her schooling is, is going to be a struggle. And I think, you know, my teacher was right in that all of my schooling was a struggle, but I hope that I don't really believe she was right that, you know, that I wasn't going to amount to much. Um, but really, in grade one, you know, I was sentenced to a life of challenge and difficulty and struggle. And in fact, one of my coping mechanisms in that first year of schooling was to spend most of my time or a lot of my time in the washroom, right? And I think my teacher was very happy because um, she didn't really know how to help me. Uh, so if I was out of the classroom, that worked well for both of us. Uh, you know, I avoided the, the frustration and the, the meltdowns, which I had a lot of those in grade one. In fact, sometimes the teacher would have to um, give early recess to the other students because I was sobbing in the classroom and she had to remove the other students. And for me, learning how to read was difficult, learning how to write. I read things backwards, I wrote backwards. Numbers were just really foreign to me. So if somebody would give me 12 and 14, I'd add the four and the one and then the two and the one because it didn't mean anything to me. It was just random numbers. And so that, that was my beginning. I was very lucky. My mother was a teacher. She was a, an educator and uh, she had won an award in the province of Ontario in Canada, where I'm from, for her contributions to education. And she was determined that her daughter was going to learn how to read and learn how to write. So every day I came home from school at lunch because um, the school was actually right across the road. I could look out my living room window and see my school. And I would get flashcards with numbers on them, with letters on them. And after school, I would come home and get flashcards. And I kind of joked that I became a workaholic in grade one. And that's what it took to... Um, to learn things that other students were just learning naturally. Uh, it took that heroic effort and energy. And I'm deeply grateful to my mother because if she hadn't, you know, spent her lunch hours and, and, you know, after school doing that, I probably wouldn't have learned how to read and write. So eventually I learned those basic skills, um, but it didn't address the learning difficulty. Everything still took me, you know, 10, 20, 30 times longer than other students to master um, and some students, you know, for whatever reason, don't want to put in that effort. And I certainly understand that for whatever reason in my makeup, I just, I was willing to put in that effort to put in that extra time, but at a tremendous cost. So it had an impact on social relations because I was working so hard just to tread water in school. Plus, I didn't really understand why people did what they did. Like, you know, making those connections and having insight didn't exist in my world. The cause and effect, like why things happen. So, you know, I struggled socially, I struggled academically. I did have some strengths, which a lot of students with learning difficulties do. I had a, um, a photographic memory, so I could look at, you know, my notebooks and I could actually memorize the text. And I had a verbatim auditory memory, so I could listen to the teachers talking and memorize what they were saying. So my strategy was when I would go into an exam, I would look at the question, hope that I understood it, which I didn't always. And then I flip through my mind to try to find the page that I've memorized or flip through my auditory memory to try to remember what the teacher had said and put that information down. So sometimes I would do really well. I'd get 100% because I made a good match. And sometimes I'd get 10% because I made a really bad match. And my teachers would conclude that I hadn't worked hard for that 10%. Well, I worked equally hard to get the 10% as I did the 100%. And that's not unusual when, you know, you look at a student with a learning difficulty, often effort doesn't lead to the same kind of results one, one would expect. So, you know, that was kind of my, my journey through school was working exceptionally hard, not really understanding my world, being very confused and being frightened and anxious a lot of the time and depressed. 
um, I developed a negative self-concept. I didn't feel good about myself. Um, you know, I, I didn't, I always felt like I didn't fit in. Like, like somehow I was, I, I was a misfit. Like I was always on the outside of everything. Um, I talk about, I lived in what I call lag time. I didn't live in real time because I didn't understand things in real time. Like I would memorize them, go away, play it over in my mind to try to understand it. And if I did finally understand it, it was too late because nobody would wait, you know, for me to play that over to then be able to interact. Um, you know, I had this image that I grew up with that, you know, there was this banquet happening, like all these people having a wonderful time. Um, and I had my face kind of like, you know, pressed against a plate glass window, looking into the banquet, but I couldn't join because I didn't understand what was, what was going on or what was happening. And because I had those strengths, you know, I managed to get through, you know, high school, I managed to get into university. But again, you know, in university, I was working probably 20 hours a day, seven days a week, sleeping four hours, I, I damaged my immune system, I have an immune system disorder, because of all that anxiety and stress, it has an impact on your health. Um, and then I did get into graduate school and I went into graduate school to study school psychology because I wanted to understand, in essence, like why was I struggling so much in, in learning? So I went into the field that identifies learning difficulties. And it was in graduate school that somebody handed me a book that changed my life, which was The Man with the Shattered World. And it was written by the brilliant Russian neuropsychologist Alexander Luria, who was looking at um, soldiers during World War II who had very localized head injury or head wounds. Um, and so he was starting to map the function of different parts of the brain. So if there's injury in one area, what does that mean in terms of, you know, what the person can no longer do, therefore what's the job of that part of the brain? And as I read this um, soldier's story in this book, I thought, we're living the same life, right? That, that I know I didn't have, you know, a piece of shrapnel in my head, but the things that he could not do after his injury, I hadn't been able to do from birth. Like he couldn't tell time. He couldn't read a clock after his injury. I was now 26 and I still couldn't tell time. I couldn't read a clock. He struggled with understanding relationships, understanding why things happen. And we were both writing in our journal using the same language, talking about that meaning was ephemeral. It would just disappear into a fog. We could not grasp things. So as a result of reading that book, I realized my problem is my brain, like something isn't working properly. And so what do I do about that? The next piece of the puzzle came in um, uh, Mark Rosenschweig's work. He was at uh, Berkeley in California, and he was looking at this idea of neuroplasticity, which really means that our brain is capable of change through stimulation, through experience. And this was in 1978, and I call that the time of the pre-neuroplastic paradigm because I started going to my professors and saying, wow, I, I think my problem is part of my brain. And they said, learning difficulties have nothing to do with the brain. I mean, that was a belief at that time. Now we know that isn't the case. Yeah. Um, and then they said, and even if it did have something to do with the brain, your brain is fixed. So, you know, there's nothing you could do about it. So I went away and thought, okay, I have to try, like, you know, I just, you know, what I have to lose but time and I can't tell time and I didn't see a future for myself. I didn't have a dream at that point. I had no dreams because I just, everything was such a struggle. Like I just didn't think anybody would hire me. Um, I just, I truly didn't see a future for myself. So I said, I, I have to try. Um, if, if the brain is capable of change, maybe... I can make an activity or an exercise that will force my brain to change in the areas where I had difficulty. And that was the beginning of my work in 1978. I created an experiment for myself um, and I chose clocks, not that I wanted to get better at telling time, which eventually I did and now I can tell time, but I wanted to find an activity that would force my brain to process relationships, because that's what I couldn't do. I couldn't see connections. I couldn't see how something related to something else. And what is a clock but a relationship? You know, the, the relationship between the two hands um, is, is, 
you know, you have to process that relationship to interpret it. And Luria, in several of his books, talked about if someone has the difficulty that I believed I had, they can't tell time, and I couldn't. So that was my hypothesis. If I can force my brain to, you know, tell time, process relationships, maybe I can change it. No idea if it would work because um, nobody was looking at that at that time. There wasn't a belief that there was human neuroplasticity. So, you know, I set out, you know, creating these clocks, like drawing clock faces, reading clock faces. I had to get a friend to help me because I couldn't tell time. But after probably several thousand hours of, you know, drawing clocks, reading clocks, I was able to start telling time, which was great. Um, but I didn't really feel, you know, any change in my understanding of my world. So I thought I have to make it harder. So I added another hand, which is like a second hand. So now I was processing three relationships. And then I decided to make it even harder. So I added a fourth hand. And for me, it was at that, um, you know, mastering the, what we call the four hand clocks, where I got my breakthrough, where, and it was really significant to me because before I worked really, really hard and, you know, certainly accomplished certain things, but still struggled with learning. After I mastered the four-handed clocks, I could do things that before with the best effort and will in the world, I could never do. I could now listen to a conversation and understand it as the person was talking. Before, I'd never mm -hmm. been able to do that. Um, I could read a page in a book and I could actually understand it as I was reading it. Before I might read that page 10, 15, 20 times before I could understand what the person was saying. And sometimes even after 20 times, I still wasn't certain because with that problem, you, can, you never grasp meaning. So you're always left in a sense of uncertainty or in a fog. The fog lifted. I could now see what was right in front of my face and understand it. I could understand people. I could understand why people did things. My social world and my social relations changed. I could understand mathematics. I went back and taught myself all of math from grade one all the way up through college level. Um, it, it was huge. You know, um, I could listen to um, documentaries and understand what they were discussing, whereas before I'd memorize them, but I didn't really understand them. So I knew that the brain was capable of, of change. And then I had a couple of other problem areas. I didn't just have one learning difficulty. So I went back into Luria's work, tried to understand what part of the brain that was, what um, job did it do? And then I created exercises for those. So um, before I couldn't read maps, I would get lost all the time. So I created an exercise for that. Now I can navigate, I can read maps, I travel around the world and I don't get lost. Um, then another area was what we call kinesthetic perception. I was really clumsy, really awkward. I didn't know where the left side of my body was in space. Created an exercise for that. Now I can play sports. I'll never be a gifted athlete, but I can actually you know, hold my own in sports where I couldn't before. Um, and when I saw those changes, I thought I wanted to take this work out into the world and help other people. And that's where my work began in 1978. And then in 1980, I opened a school in Toronto in Canada. Um, and then in about 1997, I decided I want to take this work out of just my school because there are a lot of people out in the world that I thought could benefit. And that's when I started um, working with teachers and with schools. Um, and now I think we're, the program is in 90 schools in 10 countries and in empowering lives and in Brisbane. So that is, that is my dream is that this work is accessible um, to students no matter where they are in the world so they can then dare to dream and not even just dare to dream but they have the cognitive ability the learning ability to actually effectively realize their dreams i mean to me that's what's so powerful about this work is it it opens um, a world of possibilities it changes the reality for these students and it transforms their future so i'm humbled you know that um, this work came through me that, that I was able to develop this so other students can benefit. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because um, just when I read your book, I thought I was uh, reading about my daughter because she, how she was coping through school was her phenomenal memory. Um, like in 
prep, she knew all the te- all the parents' names, you know, first names, and she she it was amazing. Um, but she had significant um, cognitive areas. And I, I would say it was about the four hands that we, we saw a dramatic change. We saw changes along the way. Um, but what convinced us, because we came for the six weeks and we stayed for the nine months because we didn't want to come home and not access it. And, you know, I remember telling people and people thought we were crazy. <laughs> You know, people look at us like we had two heads and we were tracing this dream that wasn't a reality. That's how I felt some of the people thought of us. But a bit like you, when we were told that um, our, our daughter would never talk, I was a bit like, but if people who've had a stroke can relearn how to talk, surely I can teach my daughter how to talk. And not knowing I was on this journey, uh, again, of like, you know, the neuroplasticity. Um so I saw a lot of change in her um, and that so much so that when my younger son, um, after having read your story, started to write his everything backwards and um, we could not get was, he always read was a saw. Um, yeah. And that was, you know, two years we repeated prep and we did two years and I just knew straight away he needed to do Arrowsmith until we addressed that cognitive issue schooling was going to be torturous for him um and so he's he's done two years and and he's just blossomed and um i just when i was looking at starting empowering lives um you know we were thinking about the arrowsmith program and what um what the arrowsmith program had had done for our family and that's where we came up with the name empowering lives because we felt like it actually empowered um our daughter's life Um, and one of the mottos that we have is, you know, hope lives here, freedom is found here because they get, they, they get free from this Mm -hmm. diagnosis that it's quite funny because, um, everyone I talk to, it seems to be year one, they get this diagnosis that writes them off for the rest of their lives. You know, the six (laughs) and told that, you know, like a life sentence, um, you know, we were told, brace yourself. She's going to get worse as she gets older, you know, and, um, it, you, you, you've ridden these kids off for the rest of their lives. Um, but, you know, and I feel like as, as students leave, the, their lives have been changed. And, um, I mean, I read the book um, about the wounded, wounded soldier because every time you've mentioned you've read a book, I would go get that book out. And I remember going to all the Toronto libraries and looking for books that you had mentioned that you had read because I was wanting to understand it all. Um, I'm amazed how you picked that up from that book because <laughs> I didn't pick it up at all. Um, it was a fascinating book, but yeah, I was very amazed how you picked that up to help yourself. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I feel like your work, it, it empowers people's, these kids' lives or even adults' lives. Um, one of the things in your book that I read was, you know, some of these people that were 50 and they mm-hmm. wanted they had lost all those years of dreams that they wanted to do but couldn't do. Um, And then now they were addressing it and the freedom that it brought to them no matter what age. Um, Yeah. yeah. To me, that's really exciting is that there's neuroplasticity across the lifespan. I mean, we've worked with students as young as sort of four or five and as old as 81, right? And as I'm getting older, it's really encouraging that, you know, there's still neuroplasticity left in this this brain. And, you know, as I'm getting older, I, I can feel, you know, in some areas I'm not as sharp. There's a little bit of cognitive decline. And I've gone back in to work on the clocks exercise. And I'm, you know, I can feel it starting to sharpen again. So no matter what age we are, you know, our brain can benefit from this this kind of work. Mm. And I have been doing the box and I like the four hands, which is quite challenging. But I must admit, I feel it's hard to explain. It's hard. One, I have found it quite addictive. I haven't been able to have been like wanting to master. Um, but just the clarity in my head in thinking. I, I don't know mm-hmm. if that makes sense to you, but I just feel like in a situation coming up it things seem to be easier to, and, and the clarity um of being able to make a decision has been has been easier for me um yeah yeah so i mean listen all of my whole family my three kids have done it i've got a, a middle son who um didn't have any learning difficulties he did it as an enhancement um which he brought his marks up from a b to an a 
Um, my daughter, who was pretty much ridden off in year one, um, we got her retested and, and she's in the top 10% of Australia in some, in some areas of the academic areas that she was tested in. So, um, which we knew she was bright. And I must admit, the very first time we had been to many appointments, it was when we came to Arrowsmith and we had an assessment done. Very first, she was 10. Very first time anyone said to us, you've got a bright daughter here. You know, and I just, I mean, I, I, I cry in every, every <laughs> assessment we have, they come back with the bad news and I, and I cried again. And, and Jason, your principal got the tissues for me because it was like, yes, that's what we, we can see that and what's we believe. And um, yeah. And, and now she is, she can do whatever she wants because she's addressed these cognitive areas and she's, and she is very bright. She's the really, a bit like your photographic memory, she's really good to have in your team for trivia nights because she loves reading <laughs> general knowledge, she loves reading the news, and she remembers unusual pieces of information. Um, mm -hmm. So she's really good to have on your on your trivia night. But even her ability to now just, you know, cook and um, cook a meal for the family and understand measurements and maths was very hard for her. Like she had learnt it by rote. Um, and once she was, she did the Aerosmith program intensively for the nine months we came back, she could suddenly understand the relationship between numbers, which, mm -hmm. um, yeah, she couldn't before. So they're, they're some of the great changes that we have seen. Um, so I just wanted to ask if there's something that you could share with us that maybe just on a personal note, um, that we may not know about you. Um, like I'm a twin sister, I've got identical twin, um, and we get mixed up all the time. Um, if there's something that, um, yeah, that you could share with us all that yeah. we may not know. Yeah, well, I think, I don't know if people know, do or don't know this. I'm a passionate gardener. I just love gardening. And I view, like, for me, gardening is art in slow motion. Because um, you think about, you know, seasons and color and texture and foliage. And um, so that's my meditation is, is uh, gardening. And we're just now in North America going into spring. Um, so every morning now, obviously, because we're still in, you know, social distancing here, um, I just love, I go out in my garden and look at all of the, you know, the peonies and the hostas and the Japanese maples, everything that's just starting to uh, blossom and bloom. And, um, yeah, that's just, that's my, my Zen. That's my meditation. Um, I love, I love gardening. Oh, wow. Well, you have to come to my place. <laughs> I seem to kill a lot. I, mind you, in the in the isolation, we've we've become farmers and we're growing some corn. And I've I've managed mm -hmm. to keep one bean plant alive, and we've got some carrots. And um, yeah, so I'm not very good at remembering to water them, but um, I love I love looking at people's gardens who are who are you know they look very nice. Um, mm -hmm. oh, I just one more question I just wanted to ask you is. In terms of like your parents' belief in you, and mm -hmm. I guess, um, yeah, the the involvement that your parents played in your life um, to get you through school and to and university, because you your dad was an inventor. Yeah. So so my mum was the educator, and she was the one that you know without her, um, I I can't say I was happy at the time because it was a lot of work, but. I am so deeply, profoundly grateful uh, to her and to her determination that that I was going to basically learn, right? Because I, I don't know where I would have been now without her um, doing that for me, right? Really, you know, with all the flashcards and, and all of the work that she just decided she was going to do so that I would be able to learn. So that that was her her contribution and then my father was an, a scientist and inventor uh his background was maths and physics and then he became a design engineer he did something conditioned electricity you know i'm not i'm not sure that i can describe it but um from him i caught like he would bring his blueprints and his designs and you know his patents home and kind of lay them out on the living room floor and i really didn't understand 
what he was trying to describe to me or telling me, but I caught his, like the passion for the creative process, you know, the, the, the mystery and the passion. And then he, he had this belief that I think um, he definitely talked a lot about and instilled in me. He said, if there's a problem in the world and there's no solution, he said, it's your responsibility to go out and try to find a solution. And then he said, and he said, if the rest of the world tells you you can't do it, he said, don't listen. He said, this is how science goes forward. So, you know, I, I had that kind of mantra or belief system instilled in me. And I think that was um, essential for me to create this work because I had the problem and there was no solution. And the world told me you can't do it <laughs> because all my professors were saying, well, no, you can't. And I just remembered what he had told me. And I thought, I have to try. Like, I, I have to try. And I, I didn't know whether it was going to work. But now, 40 plus years later, um, you know, here we are with, with this work. And we're doing really groundbreaking research, which I'm really excited about. And if people are interested, we've got the studies on, on our website. Um, so we're working with researchers uh, at Southern Illinois University in the States, uh, University of British Columbia in Canada. We've worked with researchers at the University of Calgary in Canada and a university in Madrid in Spain. And we're looking at um, students as they go through this program. So we're looking at changes in the brain and we're seeing significant changes in network connectivity, both between networks and within networks. So where there are areas that are underconnected as the students go through the program, the connectivity strengthens. Uh, we're seeing cognitive outcomes like working memory, auditory processing, um, fluid reasoning, all change. We're seeing academic outcomes, um, you know, where students are able to now read or to spell or to comprehend or understand mathematics. And we're seeing changes in social, emotional well-being, emotional intelligence, um, and reduction uh, in cortisols, like the stress hormones. So, um, you know, really, really exciting. Like what we've seen, or what I've seen in the 40 years of this work, in the the transformation in the lives of the students. Now the research is supporting all of that, and um, so I feel, mm -hmm. you know, I made a hypothesis over 40 years ago that the brain could change, and if we could find ways to target and stimulate specific cognitive functions, we could actually change the brain, which would lead to academic changes, cognitive changes, social emotional changes, and it feels like I've come full circle now. Like Now the research is confirming what I hypothesized 40 years ago, so. Um, wow. Yeah. I'm yeah. um, you know, your first student I had read was, um, went on to be a doctor, medical doctor. Yes, 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 yeah. So, and yeah, she was, I think, four when she started. And uh, yeah, her, her parents, I just, I had never worked with somebody that young. So I had to actually invent simpler levels of the exercise because I wasn't sure if I could. And yes, no, she's, uh, and I have her picture beside me in my study, like just to remind myself of all of the students in the world um, that, you know, whose lives can be transformed through this kind of work. Mm. To see, because I guess even for, for me seeing the transformation within the students, you know, when they come in and they've, you know, got D's in maths and English, and then to get top of the class for maths, well, you know, 18 months later, it, it, it just, you know, uh, well, like I, I, I'm a bit of a crier. So, you know, I, I, I hug them and we all have a cry together with, you know, when the mums are crying, I cry. And, um, and, and so it must be like for you, I mean, you're, I, I think you're a very humble person. You're very humble. And, but for you to, to hear all these stories when you travel and the trans transformation of these people's lives and, you know, what could, their life could have been totally different. I think my, my, my daughter's life would have been so different if we hadn't have heard about your program and like literally we had no idea but we had nothing to lose and I, we always felt like we never wanted to ever think like I wish we had um mm -hmm. and you know yeah we had we had nothing to lose and I, I I felt like it was and we worked very hard for three years with her to catch her up so we had to catch her up from 
year one, you know, she'd never really sat in a maths class. She'd always gone off to learning support. We had to catch her up literally six years of maths to get her back into school. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I just feel like um, it must be so, you've walked a hard journey. You've had your mm -hmm. critics um, and, but it must be despite all of that, just, really heartwarming and amazing to see the transformation from your own hardship to what you, around the world now you're transforming so many people's lives and yeah so yeah it, it, that's most that's a um the most powerful part of all of what i do personally in my work is you know to meet the students because i was one of them right like you know i i say because all the students as you know have student numbers because we track all of the data and I was ground zero, like I was student number 0001. Um, so like I'm one of all of those students and I feel like, you know, we've walked in each other's shoes and we've shared the successes. Um, so, and to me, it it's motivates me to want to reach even more students like that. That's to me, the touchstone of this work is all of those lives that have been transformed. And that's, you know, when things are challenging or difficult, um, that is my touchstone that reminds me of, of what is essential and important and critical in this work. It is, it is all of those students out there. And it takes courage to do this work. It is hard work. It's, you know, as, as you know, watching the students and having done some of it yourself, and as I know, it is very hard work, but the results are, um, well, they're, they're transformative. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, Barbara, I don't know. I don't think I could ever thank you enough. Um, you know, it hasn't just been, we initially went for our daughter, then our younger son has done the program as well. And now um, my husband's doing the clocks. Um, we're, we're all, we've all done it and uh, I've been doing it. We've got a bit of a family, um, competition going between my husband and I um but I just want to yeah thank you so much for your time and mm -hmm. thank you for your bravery your bravery mm -hmm. uh, for you know not accepting the status quo not accepting mm -hmm. what uh, people didn't believe um and it's still a journey we've still got a long way ahead of us in getting mm -hmm. um this into schools and into education and into that 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 the brain can change um, but you've made such a, you, you forge a path and you've been a pioneer for, uh, for all of us and for our, our children. And mm -hmm. so I just, yeah, want to thank you for your time, but thank you for that, for not giving up and mm -hmm. to keep going and um, for helping transform so many people's lives. And um, I'll be forever eternally grateful. Our, our family um, absolutely adore you and, um, yeah, and just thank you so, so much. Mm. Oh, thank you.